practice of politics, there ought to be some level of truth, some level of trust, some level of confidence that you can place in the words that come from the mouth of a politician, more particularly a politician who has had the privilege of being prime minister of a country. So when a prime minister, either a sitting prime minister or former prime minister gets up and speaks, everyone listens because he would be speaking from experience, he would be speaking from knowledge, and he'd be speaking, he'd be speaking from an, an informed position, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when the member from Vifort South gets up to speak, there is great anticipation because everyone wants to hear what he's saying, his ideas, even his criticisms and his concerns. And this is appreciated by, by everyone, including me, Mr. Speaker, who has worked with him for many years. When a member from Castries North gets up to speak, again, we have sparred in different sides of the coin, of the, of the table. We've had our spar we've sparred, we've criticized each other, and all of us have done that, but we did it with a dignity. Sometimes we got rough. This is, this is the nature of the politics. You have to get rough sometimes. But there was a level of, of dignity. And I remember when we, I went to the member for uh, Castries North, and I said, I said to him, listen to me, this, what we're doing about this winner takes all, and opposition politicians get nothing. Dr. Robert Lewis and I, he, I said to him that there is this money coming from the Taiwanese. Why don't you share it? Why don't you do something if it's opposition politicians can get something? <clears throat> he, he, we agreed, and then at that time, we in the opposition got uh, some allocation. One of the matters, when there was a hurricane, he called me in his office, and we agreed that there would be some allocation between of opposition, opposition seats, and something happened with the speaker. So when he gets us to speak, we listen. And the member for the Henry North always makes a point that he hasn't got a bag of cement it's from the government when in opposition. Not the same, not the same thing I can see for the member for for North, for Cassius North. But Mr. Speaker, when the member for Miko South gets up to speak. He cannot help himself. It's either he suffers from an illness that I can't describe, or he suffers from some sort of complex. Mr. Speaker, the things that the member from Miku South speaks about, uh, you can't understand why a man can say these kind of things, when he knows very well these things can easily be disputed and can easily be shown not to be true. But he insists in saying it, and he insists in allowing some people, and some people follow him, and repeat it, and when they know very well, it's not true, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in my rebuttal, to what the minister, the member for Castries, for you, Miku South said, Mr. Speaker. I want to start from where my colleague, the Deputy Prime Minister, began. And I want to quote what he said. You can have a piece of land that is on the harbor. The piece of land is on the harbor. So everybody is clear that this is a piece of land by the end of Bannans underneath Golden Hope. <coughs> underneath Golden Hope. 100,000 square feet underwater. 
Now, land in Cassius, Mr. Speaker, goes from anywhere between 500 to 1,000 square feet. So, $1,000 a square foot. So, land at Golden Hope now is land in Cassius. <coughs> in Cassius, that is right. That is what land is going for. So, the right is when you talk about waterfront land, so I want to say this, first of all, Mr. Speaker, to have sold the land to a non entity. Nobody knows her. Who is she? Has she done any work in St. Lucia? Okay, Mr. Speaker. A St. Lucia, so a person who has no track record of doing any development in St. Lucia, unless you want to go and study her lineage and then say her father is a person who is a developer. Mr. Speaker, there's a dirty trend in St. Lucian politics perpetuated by the United Workers' Party of bringing people's families into politics, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's heartbreaking. People's children are being dragged into politics, Mr. Speaker, in the nastiest and most demeaning and the most untruthful way, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have been a victim. I am a victim, but I'm not going to that now. But what, what I must say is when the leader, when the member for Castries for Mikusov gets up and he says that we celebrate what is best being St. Lucia, we cannot ask Mr. Speaker for other persons to hold us in the highest esteem if we, are, if we allow ourselves to go or to allow ourselves for politics to do that. So, Mr. Speaker, I felt very strongly about the content of a meme, and I know it has happened in the past, and I'm saying we need, we need, we need to do better. I said it from the get-go. Mr. Speaker, I love to see, Mr. Speaker, the members come always to the House saying today is a new beginning. So again, Mr. Speaker, I just want to make it clear whether the members on the opposite side accept the apology, accept the statements, it, I hope, that they would in good faith, but the reality is they want, we want to disassociate ourselves from one and any and any other one that may put St. Lucians in a disrespectful light, in a disgusting position, we are better, we are better. And in fact, if in fact we are going to fight crime, Mr. Speaker, these are the little things that make a big difference in terms of how we see and portray ourselves. So, Mr. Speaker, on the note, I thank you for your indulgence, and I'm hoping that we all, everyone in civil society, takes up the mantra that we are going to collectively listen ourselves, condemn, and ridicule anybody who does that. That was on the 22nd of March, Mr. Speaker. That's on the 22nd of March. And then, on yesterday, less than 10 days later, he calls somebody an entity. Nobody knows her. Who is she? Has she done any work in St. Lucia? Mr. Speaker, this is where the politics of St. Lucia has got, Mr. Speaker. And then you go on in social media and you denigrate people's children. You put their pictures up. You put an arrow directing to them so that they can be easily identified, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, you know how emotional the politics can get. You can easily identify it. That's the second time the picture of that, of that young lady was put on the, tele, on the social media, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what kind of example are we setting in this country? What kind of example are we setting in this country, Mr. Speaker? When a former prime minister can be on, can be, can put on the public record a non-entity. Nobody knows her. Who is she? When we're speaking about a youth economy, when we're speaking about getting young people involved, Mr. Speaker, that is so. That is the example that we set. That is the example we set, Mr. Speaker, for our country in the name of politics, Mr. Speaker. That's what we do. And our surrogates get on, it, on, on lives, on the television, and say the most, the most bitter things about people's children. 
Mr. Speaker, I spoke about trust. Yesterday, you heard the member for Microsoft tell you, Mr. Speaker, that we were not speaking the truth when we spoke about Orange Grove, and he knew nothing about any courthouse decision as it relates to Orange Grove. He, he said, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, he said, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, the courthouse that the Prime Minister is making reference to was never part of the deal. The fact is, is that the regional court, the regional court of St. Lucia is hosted in St. Lucia and we are currently paying rent for the regional court in town. Is that not so? Okay. Who makes the decision to determine where the regional court goes? Thank you. So by which ministry? Which ministry makes the decision? So the regional court. <laughs> so the regional court, when they want to move somewhere, who did they go? They gave the Ministry of Justice. To the Ministry of Justice to determine. Mr. Speaker, the OECS Court of Appeal, the regional court, has been in St. Lucia for ages. There was no decision as to where the court is to be located, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the court has been complaining about build about space. I'm complaining about space, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Complaining about facilities. Complain about the damn going no space for the judges because they need more judges, Mr. Speaker. You may recall, Mr. Speaker, the member from Microsoft, when he was talking about developments in St. Lucia and how it's his government that has the economy to do well, he spoke about the Diamond Mall. He said that the Diamond Mall was part of the reasons why St. Lucia was doing well because he had done the Diamond Mall. But he came yesterday and he said, the courthouse, and his exact words, Mr. Speaker, is there was never a contract signed to have caused the regional court to go where. It was never, never. That's what he said. There is <laughs> so the regional court, and I quote, when they want to move to somewhere, who do they go? They go to the Ministry of Justice. It's for the Ministry of Justice to make the determination as to where they're going to go. This is nothing to do with the building. Yes, quotation, the leader of the opposition. He said, this, that is nothing to do with the building. So don't try to make it. If you don't want, if you don't want the regional court to go there, you don't have to agree. There was never a contract signed to have caused the regional court to go where. Never, never. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is the same gentleman as Prime Minister who was speaking to the Chief Justice on a number of occasions about the Court of Appeal, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and I'm going to write you a, read you a letter, Mr. Speaker, which clarifies it. Orange Grove Plaza Limited is written to Mr. Darrell Moncho, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Public Service. That was the time when he was Permanent Secretary, Mr. And it's clear, Ministry of the Public Service, they are the ones who deliver rental of buildings. Who was Minister of the Public Service? The Honorable Prime Minister at the time. But here, he says, go to the Ministry of Justice. This is the letter. The main purpose of this letter is to provide huh, the date 17th December 2021. The main purpose of this letter is to provide clarity on the course 17th December 2021. 17th 2021, listen. We were inquiring as to what's happened at building. The main purpose of this letter is to provide clarity on the course of the fit out for the Eastern Caribbean Central Court at Orange Grove. 
the, the gentleman says there was no agreement. Lease agreement between the Orange Grove Plaza Limited and the St. Lucia government slash Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Through discussions with the government of St. Lucia, the government of St. Lucia determined that the property known as the Dyer Mall was in an area with great potential. Understanding the objective of the Castries Redevelopment Program, we accepted, we, ac we acceded to the request of the government of St. Lucia and began actively pursuing the redevelopment of the abandoned project and determined that the space would be suitable for government and commercial entities. When completed, the total building will provide 177,000 square feet of administrative and commercial accommodation in two separate buildings. A lease agreement has already been executed with the government of St. Lucia for 78,406 square feet for a 15-year period with a revisionary cause, a revisionary cause, after which this space will be owned by the government of St. Lucia. The ground floor of that building will be, will be tenanted by retail stores, a vision facility, and a supermarket. A draft rental lease agreement for the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court in the other building is currently at the offices of the Attorney General for review. That's the man, the man who said he knows nothing about it. <laughs> the agreed leaseable space is $71,945 square foot at a rental rate of EC $5 per square foot. With respect to the fit-out lease, which we refer to as the secondary lease, we are confirming a maximum cost of EC $3 per square foot for a period of seven years, after which the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court or the government of St. Lucia will then own the furniture and fixtures. The space will be fully customized to meet the functional, security, and other specific requirements of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, including a prisoner holding facilities. The building shares one common wall with the other buildings, but is designed to operate independently. The aspect of the project would be implemented using a turnkey arrangement. You see what was a turnkey arrangement? Yesterday he said it was a government building. <laughs> Conceptual designs based on user requirements have already been approved and signed off by the Eastern. Listen to that. Conceptual designs based on user requirements have already been approved and signed off by the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court with several iterations. Copies of designs will be forwarded on the separate cover and a, pres and a presentation can be arranged if required. Now, we have provided clarity and confirmation on the fit out cost for the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, we are looking forward to moving to the finalization of the execution of the primary lease agreement with, at $5 a square foot. We look forward to working to a successful com completion 
and the letter is signed by the owners of Orange Group Plaza, Plaza Limited. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, mem the member for, 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 for Microsoft came in this honorable house and told you that you can go if you want. It's the Ministry of Justice that is dealing with this, that courthouse, that building, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, do you think, do you think, Mr. Speaker, it's, re it's right that for the sake of politics, somebody can come and stand in this honorable house and say that kind of thing, Mr. Speaker? Do I Mr. Speaker, it is sad, Mr. Speaker. That's why young people do not go into politics. It is sad, very sad. Because when someone can come in open court, in open, for the whole world to see, and say things that are obviously not true. But let me tell you why he's saying things are obvious. That, why, let me tell you why he's saying that. Because he was complaining about the rental expenses in the estimates. Now, here's a government acting in good faith. If a prime minister or government begins negotiations with a foreign investor or investor, and the investor, based on the word of the government, puts millions of dollars in a building, on the word. First of all, there is one signed lease agreement for the office space. And let me tell you how much that, that will cost, Mr. Speaker. The office space that the government, that the government, the last government signed for, that will cost the government of St. Lucia for 16 and a half years, $313,624 a month. Three million seven hundred and sixty-three thousand four hundred and eighty-eight dollars EC per month. That's what they signed for. And it will cost, Mr. Speaker, and it will cost a further twelve million dollars for retrofitting. Now that is that is the deal that he signed with the, with, the, with the Orange Grove people, Mr. Speaker. Further, there is a maintenance charge. The maintenance charge providing the service plus 10% of a management fee. The supply removal of electricity, a portion. So that was what he signed, Mr. Speaker. That's what the government signed. Right? For the government buildings. But the same leader of opposition is talking about rent for government buildings. What do you expect us to do? You, you want us, what you want us to do is just walk away from that whole agreement. And that is what many people think we should do. But what I'm thinking of is the reputation of St. Lucia. The reputation of the world of the government of St. Lucia. And remember, for, for Shozel, you're a banker, you're a professional banker. You make a lot of, of banking decisions based on reputation. It, it is called know your customer. The reputation of a customer. If the government, and that is why we had to pay Cayman City, because you need to protect the reputation of the government, and much the chagrin of one of, of, of my colleagues, of my colleagues, because my colleagues believe that this is a travesty. Is, that's why we paid Cayman City. Because the reputation of the country, we are a small country. All we have is our reputation, Mr. Speaker. That's all we have. And this is why you cannot be callous with people's individual reputations or be callous to the reputation of the country. So here's the gentleman coming to the Honorable House and almost denying the fact that he knows anything about the courthouse building. After he's had several discussions with, with the learned Chief Justice, after they've they, they put, they, they, they put, they've done all the drawings together, after the Eastern Caribbean Court has approved the drawings, Mr. Speaker, the gentleman is saying, he knows, oh, go ahead, Minister of Justice, do the audio on it. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, really? But, what will they do? They'll go on Facebook tonight and attack my daughter. That 
that is the, 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 the response. That would that, be the response, you know. Not the response to the facts, but the response to the response is going to be a personal attack on me and a personal attack on my daughter and my family. That's going to be the response. So I wait for it. Mr. Speaker, you see the dilemma I find myself in? Let, let that enter you further, Mr. Speaker, the cost of the cost of what the government for the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal. The rent, and that is including the, the, the I want to the shoe fully fitted out, would be $504,000 per month. Thereafter, an increase of 10% will be applied every five years. This represents an increase of $360,000 per month for rent for the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal. And a security deposit of one month. Mr. Speaker, so in the estimate, we put in $5 million because we were not sure when that will finish to protect St. Lucia's reputation. But the leader of the opposition comes in here and one breath he says that was his work and that's how, that's how we achieved a surplus. By the next breath, he denies it completely. What do you do, Mr. Speaker? What do you do? What do I tell these men and women? What do I tell them? Mr. Speaker, I move on. The leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, said that St. Lucia is doing well because of what he did, because of his work, because of the things that he did, Mr. St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia experienced a 22% drop in GDP after COVID. The highest drop in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's an economy that was, that was doing well. That was an economy that was doing very well, Mr. Speaker. And COVID did not only, did not only attack St. Lucia, COVID attacked the entire Latin America, the whole of Latin America, Mr. Speaker. Now, let me tell you some of what happened in, in the other countries. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, what happened in the other countries as far as the drop in GDP was concerned. And that's a country you say you run so well. And the figures will show in a while, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> St. Lucia's job was 24.4%, and the Bahamas, 23.8%, declining GDP after COVID, 2020. Barbados, 13.7. Belize, 13.7. Let's go closer home. Grenada, 13.8. Jamaica, 10%. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 5.3% drop in, in, in 2020. St. Lucia, 24.4%. Guyana is the only one with an increase of 43.5%. 43, 43 that is how the economy decreased or the loss on, of GDP after COVID. St. Lucia had the highest. But you know why St. Lucia had this figure? Because St. Lucia's economy had already begun to show signs, downside risk before COVID. So when COVID struck, it took, a, it took us over the board. But during COVID, we borrowed over $300 million. But that $300 million, Mr. Speaker, less than $20 million of these dollars were used for direct support to people. The direct support came from the NIC. That's where the direct support came, from the NIC, Mr. Speaker. And we've pledged, at some point when, it's, when the time is right, to pay the NIC people back the money. That is where the that is where it came. The came from, Mr. Speaker. 
But Mr. Speaker, during that time, what did the government do? They were busy doing DFCs for elections. They were busy doing roads with the fair election time, Mr. Speaker. So that $300 million that they borrowed, because of the weakness of the economy at the time, they had to take it to pay salaries, and that is what manifests itself in the figures that we inherited. Of course, COVID was a factor. Of course, we know COVID was a factor, Mr. Speaker. But what came after COVID was the Ukraine war, which we'll deal with in a few seconds. So, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition goes and he quotes figures, and in wanting to demean the primary surplus that we have achieved, in wanting to demean the fact that we've reduced our, our overall deficit, to demean it, Mr. Speaker, goes chance, tries to quote some figures, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have an extract from the Economic and Social Review. You may recall, Mr. Speaker, that the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party came into government in the year 20, lost government, came into government in the year 20, we lost government, right? We lost government in the year 2011, right? We lost election in the year 2011. We won. We won, sorry. We won in 2011. Look at what they inherited. A current balance. A current balance of 59.3%, a surplus. $59 million, surplus. By the time we went into 2012, the current balance was minus $52 million. Yeah, minus, right, they inherited that, then we got it minus, we had, we, had to, we had to take it because minus $50 million, then we bought it one year, it went minus $3 million. Then in 2014, it went back up $36 million. In 2015, $82 million. 2015, 16. And when we gave it to them in 2017, it was $92 million. That is, and when we gave it, the overall balance was 70, $79 million, the overall balance. And we took it at $227 million. So between these years, we brought it down to $79 million. That's what we gave them in 2017. Social and economic review. That's not what, that is when the minister, the member of yourself was Minister of Finance. These are the facts. These are the facts, Mr. Speaker. These are the facts. And it's this one printed by me. These are the facts, and you can check it out in the Social Economic Review. And when they got it in 2019, in 2016, they got it 79 million. That's what, that's what they got, Mr. Speaker. So what they inherited was a platform of sustainability, a platform that they, we could move on from. And by 2019, before COVID, we already were in deficit, current balance deficit of $43 million before COVID hit. Before COVID hit. Before COVID. That's, that's, that's where you were. So you understand why we had problems? And right now, we've taken it from last year. We've taken it from, Mr. Speaker, when we got it, we, we, we last year, we had anticipated that we would have in 2022, 2023. When you took it in 21, our, our overall deficit was $224 million, and our primary deficit was $156 million. We took it from there, and we brought it into one year to have a surplus of $29 million. And we brought down the overall deficit 
from $444 million to $257 million. And the Prime Minister and the member for Microsoft speaks about revenue. So he says that we did not collect, we collected more revenue, so we should bring down the price of gas. Mr. Speaker, the price of gas is a function of international markets. We know nothing about it, we don't control that. He was the one who raised it by 150. He was the one purportedly to put it in a lockbox. To put it in a lockbox. That's what he said. The lockbox, we have looked for the lockbox. <laughs> when the minister, for, when the deputy prime minister is acting as finance, I've asked him to look for the lockbox. When he's acting, I've asked him to look for the lockbox. When he's, acting, look the lockbox. When he's in the ministry, I've asked him to look for the lockbox. Nobody can find the lockbox. That lockbox is not, cannot be found. He brought it up by 150, Mr. Speaker. But we have subsidized fuel and subsidized LPG in particular. We had budgeted to subsidize it by $8. Sometimes you end up at spending as much as $20 for the subsidy on cooking gas, Mr. Speaker. But because of the buoyancy of the economy, and because of the fact that there had been some inflation, our excise, our excise con tax consumption has increased. But the leader of the opposition tells us, we should not, we should not, we should not, we should allow gas to be sold at $13.95. But remember, he's the one, thank you, he's the one who increased the, the, the tax in it, eh? if we had allowed gas to be sold at $13.95, Mr. Speaker, we would have had to subsidize petroleum products by over $80 million. That is what would be the cost of that. And what would happen, Mr. Speaker, what would happen even if we have an increase in revenue, and I said in my estimates, we still have a current deficit. We are still spending more than we are getting. What we did is we had a primary surplus in that we can pay our, our interest, not all, our, not all of our current expenses. If we continue on this track, Mr. Speaker, if we continue on this track, we will have to seek interference from the International Monetary Fund. Because we cannot continue to live beyond our means in this way. So what are we doing? We are making adjustments. We are reducing expenditure. We are making adjustments. But that was the same member when he was, mem when he was Mr. Finance, reduced VAT by two and a half percent. And up to today, no one can tell me what did the reduction of VAT do for them at the supermarket. There is no one who can say what the reduction of VAT did for them at the supermarket. This week. So the minister, the member from Microsoft, wants us to continue in a trend of deficit, 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 to reach a point where we have to go to the National Monetary Fund to help us because it can't continue at that at that rate. And it's the same member who put us we have to spend forty-six million dollars a year to pay DFCs for roads, some roads to nowhere. That is that is the position that we found ourselves, Mr. Speaker. And he and the member speaks about the economy and how we mismanage the economy, Mr. Speaker. So Mr. Speaker our deficit remains, and we have to make adjustments for our deficit, our deficit. And to make it worse, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia has the lowest VAT in the region. So when he speaks about other countries, St. Lucia has the lowest VAT in the region, Mr. Speaker. And St. Lucia has subsidized petroleum products and subsidized LPG gas, Mr. Speaker. In a, sometimes 20 dollars 
full cylinder solution. So anytime a, cons a consumer buys a 20 pound cylinder of gas, at some point, the government put in $20 for him. Mr. Speaker, the member for Mikusov makes, talks about subscription and grants. And make that give first. Subscription and grants. You're all taking money to enjoy yourself. Give people subscription and grants, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, the truth. Mr. Speaker, do you know? He cited the grants in the Prime Minister's office and saying that these grants were because we were, we were wasting, you're giving people things. Mr. Speaker, you know what these grants related to? They related to moving the grants, moving the subscriptions that we make to the Association of Caribbean Commissioners of Police, the subscriptions to the regional security system, to the grants, the subscriptions to the OECS Central Secretariat. We moved it from these areas and put it in the office of the Prime Minister because these are the direct results under the portfolio of the Prime Minister. That is what caused the grants to go up. Moving up an entry of moving the OECS Central Secretariat, $3 million, our commitments, the regional and the regional security system, $2 million, two and three five. That is what caused the grants to go up, Mr. Speaker. Grants and subscriptions. It's in one block, grants and subscriptions. So that's what made the grants, grants go up in the Prime Minister's office. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition speaks about interest rates. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows that interest rates have increased. Everyone knows that. Everyone, Mr. Speaker, interest rates have increased. Interest rates have increased. It was 1%. It was 1%, Mr. Speaker, when he was in office. Right now, it's at 5% and climbing. So we had to make a projection for increasing interest rates because the loans that we have, they are, they, are, they are at variable interest rates, Mr. Speaker, and interest rates in the national market are increasing all the time. Mr. Speaker, he speaks about salaries and wages, and he says, that's job to the boys, job to the boys, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, do you know the reason why salaries and wages have gone up? is because we paid civil servants their back pay and we paid them their pay increase without any, without any acrimony. We paid them their pay increase, we paid them their back pay. Even some units that did not negotiate, we paid them the same amount as everybody else. That, that is why it went up. And retiring benefits, Mr. Speaker, retiring benefits, when people work hard in the civil service and they, re, and they go, they go, they leave, those who do not contribute to the NIC, we must pay them their benefits. And that is why retiring benefits went up, Mr. Speaker. Not because there was any massive increase in employment, it's because the retiring benefits for these people went up, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, grant and, 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 and sub, sub, subscriptions. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, where grants and subscriptions increase. And I want to ask you, Mr. Speaker, whether you think, in your good judgment, that's not, that is not the right place, that was not, that was not necessary, Mr. Speaker. I want, you, I want to ask you whether you think that was necessary, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, grants and subscriptions, here is where, here is where they went up. $250,000 for, for the marketing board. For agriculture, we give them, we subscribe $250,000 to them, Mr. Speaker. Grant and subscriptions. These, these, these are the increases that, that he's complaining about, Mr. Speaker. These are increases he's complaining about, Mr. Speaker. $7 million increase in grants and subscriptions. $3 million increase in subvention for St. Jude. We shouldn't do that. $3.6 million increase in subvention to the Millennium Heights Complex. $10,000 
increased intervention to diabetic and hypertension association. $20,000 to cater for childhood development center. $10,000 for the autism, um, autism society. $20,000 to cerebral palsy association. $300,000 increased to cater for payment of medical assistance for the less fortunate. This, not, I shouldn't do that. These are the increases that he speaks about in grants and subscriptions, Mr. Speaker. These are the increases. Grants and contributions. And then a million dollars increase. Due to increases in provisions for subvention to the Cornerstone Humanitarian Society, $20,000. Increase. Cicero's Children's Home at Cicero, $20,000. Marion Home, $20,000. St. Lucy Home, $20,000. National Council for the Disabled, $20,000. St. Lucia Red Cross, $20,000. Viewfort Children's Home, $20,000. Housing Allowance, $79,000. Our Boys Matter, increased by $76,000. Subvention to feed the poor, $20,000. Rise St. Lucia subvention, $20,000. And listen to, the, listen to me, Mr. Speaker. The public assistance vote reflects an increase of 29% of $5.8 million, resulting from provisions assistance to meeting the needs of the most vulnerable and the shock response social projection projects. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, that is where it, that's where, that's where it went up. That's where it increased. It's not telling people go and look for the $1,500. That, that's where, Mr. Speaker, that is where, that is why grants and subscriptions, and that's the same member that says we're not doing enough for, do something, do something to them. What are you doing for them? We must do more. We want to do more. We are doing more. But that is why the grants and subscriptions went up, Mr. Speaker. That is why it went up. Then we had an additional subscription uh, uh, to the increase in subvention to export St. Lucia. That's, that they're doing a marvelous job in St. Lucia's export development. And I must give kudos, Mr. Speaker, to the, the executive director of export solution, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. So that is why grants and Mr. Speaker, this is why grants and, sub and subscriptions increase, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, then he speaks about, oh, you all have parties. Hosting, Mr. Speaker, you know why it went up? Because St. Lucia had to cater for the visit of Prince Edward. That's why it went up. St. Lucia had to cater for the visit of Prince Edward. So hosting and entertainment went up. He speaks about consultancy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I made a point in my budget, in my SBS debate, that as the capital projects came into maturity, that consultancies would have to increase. But let me tell you a little story about consultancies under him. <coughs> you see, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if, uh, if it's a lack of memory loss, or it's the idea that you say anything. Prime Minister, you have 10 minutes left. Oh, I have time for that in my butter, sir? Yes, one hour, but you can get an extension. Ah. Can I get, Mr. Speaker, just 15 more minutes? I'll take care. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, sorry, no, no. I can't see you, Member for the Henry North. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to invoke standing order 4210 in order to allow the Prime Minister an additional 30 minutes within which to complete his presentation. Honourable Members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the Prime Minister an additional 30 minutes in which to conclude his presentation. I now put a question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. 
extension you, granted. Thank you very much, mem, mem, colleague, minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So we spoke about subscription grants. So we got whole sentiment. Now consultancy, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the consultancies are mandated by the lending organization. There is a big project called Unfolding the Blue Economy, which will help us now food security, etc. That is mandated that the World Bank will give us the money, mandate that is there's supposed to be a certain degree of consultancy. Then we look into the matter of blue bonds, which is something we discuss in, in, in the policy statement. To deal with our debt, we look into to transfer our debt, to organ, reorganize our debt into something called blue bonds, where we use our ocean, and, and you know, Mr. Speaker, St. Lucia has more, this, the, the region has more sea space than land space. So we have to use our sea space and the work by the Minister of the Environment to protect our oceans, unfolding the blue economy, tying it into a blue bond so we can, we can assist in our debt sustainability. Mr. Speaker. That's what we're doing. That's where the consultancy are. That's where the consultancies are. That's where they are. But let me tell you what they did about consultancies. Mr. Speaker, the World Bank di dictates that all consultancies must be tendered. When the tendering process was too cumbersome, just like the grocery highway that they, they, that they speak about, and the member of you yourself will, will can clarify that, just like the grocery highway, that's why the grocery highway is where it is today. The people of St. Lucia have only the United Locust Party to blame for the grocery highway being how it is today. Only them. Amen. Nobody else. They have, they have to take full blame for the grocery highway, for the congestion and the problems in there. Full blame. So, Mr. Speaker, you know what they did? They said to the World Bank, we want to say who we give the consultancies. The World Bank said, no, show me. You know what it is, Mr. Speaker? They removed the consultancy part from the project and said to the World Bank, we'll pay for it ourselves. And they did it by direct award. So the World Bank is ready to pay for the consultancy. They said, no, don't do that. We take it away and we give it to whoever you want. And I will not tell you who they gave it to Mr. Speaker. I'm not, I'm not a bit of mentioning people's names in this honorable house. But Mr. Speaker, speaking about interest rates, that's the same Minister of Finance who signed a contract to give people interest per day. Yeah. <laughs> the same man, you know. 1%. 1 per day. This is the same Minister of Finance who speaks about interest rates. <laughs> so, what they did, Mr. Speaker, is that they took the consultancy away from the projects and they decided that they would pay it by direct award. But we, in the capital projects and the capital project that I mentioned to you, Mr. Speaker, these capital projects are very important to us and we are ensuring that the consultancies go the right way so that the projects can materialize and come to the natural Established week. And this year, we are very conservative in that we only put projects that we, are, that we know can come, can happen this year. Unfolding the, 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 the blue economy, St. Jude's Hospital, Mr. Speaker, and during the, the policy phase of this discussion, of this debate, I'll tell you a lot about St. Jude's, Mr. Speaker. Many excited things happen at St. Jude, Mr. Speaker, and to the chagrin, St. Jude Hospital is going to be completed. It's going to be completed, Mr. Speaker. St. Jude Hospital is going to be completed. So, Mr. Speaker, he came, he spoke about street lighting. So, you're speaking about the care all the time. What am I Street lighting. Mr. Speaker, do you know? And remember, if you want to solve, if he, is, if he wants, will bear testimony to what I'm saying. We had negotiated, completed negotiations in May 2016 for a replacement of all the LED lights in St. Lucia 
all the sodium lysis solution with LED lights. It was a signed, sealed loan from the Caribbean Development Bank. When they came with the government, Mr. Speaker, you heard about the Pajora letter. And that's a cause. <laughs> and the Pajora the letter appeared. And when the Pajora letter appeared, Mr. Speaker, the funding, the loan for the, from the Caribbean Development Bank was cancelled. A loan for nine million dollars cancelled. Up to today, the Caribbean Development Bank can't understand why that happened. You know why it happened, Mr. Speaker? Because the Caribbean Development Bank they had waived some of the procurement requirements to say that Lucilec should be the contributing party working with them because of Lucilec's experience, because Lucilec had been involved in that business. Because it was determined who the contracting party was be, should be, they cancelled. And the Pajora letter appeared. Yes, he, he became a big shareholder. So, Mr. Speaker, of course, the Pajora letter fell through and they looked, they introduced a firm called Kaled, Mr. Speaker. That was in 20, you know, Mr. Speaker, finally, you know, we're talking about not doing anything on performance. I want solutions to just go back a little bit and tell me one project that was done by the last government. One. Which they deny it now. Which not, not working now. Tell me, only what the last government had was was ideas. And, and that's what the boast about, you know. We had ideas. Ideas. Yes. And my friend from Labi will say, Batem Popot. And I would say, flashing mirrors, Mr. Speaker. So, so what happened? So, Kaled, that was Dewo Bot Kaled in you. Dewo Bot Kaled in. That's in 20, about 2019. COVID, okay, leave, give COVID. COVID, jump up, Kui. COVID. COVID came, Mr. Speaker. They left government in 2021, the, the people pulled them out, and nothing on Kaled. We came back and we began negotiations with Kaled because I understand about government continuity. So Kaled, when he made discussions, we had discussions with them, Kaled got a solution, had, had, had to approve it, a guarantee from a company called MIGA. MIGA, M-I-G-A, that's a company that gives guaranteed guarantees to private sector firms once they get the money from the World Bank. To, to, so, so that the local counterpart will not, have to have, will not have to get so much exposure in terms of guarantees. I mean, I'm pleased to tell you, after these negotiations, back and forth, clean up arrangements, back and back and forth, I'm pleased to tell you, Mr. Speaker, and colleagues will be happy to hear that the street lighting project is on course and the first set of lights will arrive in St. Lucia at the end of April this year. And that has been confirmed, Mr. Speaker, by a press release from Washington. From Washington, not from me, because you know, I would never come and say that here if I wasn't sure. From Washington, Mr. Speaker, here's what it reads. MIGA has issued guarantees to Kellett Capital and CIFI LATAM to support installation, operation, and servicing of a, mod of a modernized streetlight network in St. Lucia. The project consists of replacing all 22,000 of the island sodium streetlights with LEDs and installing 2,460 new LED streetlights. This will lead to a greenhouse gas emission reduction. Mr. Environment, you like to hear that? This will lead to a greenhouse gas emission reduction of 5,000 tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent to, equivalent to CO2e per year, while increasing light levels by over 40% across the road network. We're heading for net zero. MIGA's guarantees total 11.7 million are covering an 
equity investment by Kaled for 15 years and an eight-year loan and an eight-year loan. St. Lucia depends heavily on imported petroleum products to power its economy and among the highest electricity tariffs in the world. The government of St. Lucia is working to transition to a lower carbon economy and undertake initiatives to promote climate resilience, energy efficiencies. This project is an important initiative that is consistent with the government's climate change policy and demonstrates its commitment to increase energy efficiency that the country's carbon, that reduces the carbon's footprint. The first project, MIGA is supporting in St. Lucia, will help the country meet its national climate targets. That is what we are doing, Mr. Speaker. So that is why that's what we are doing. And here's what. Energy savings from the LED street lights are estimated to about 6.8 GWH per year, corresponding to a monetary savings of about $2.3 million per year, which will enable the government to focus on other developmental products, initiatives. High electricity rates have a, ne have a negative effect on businesses and people in St. Lucia. World Bank Director Lila Burnick Reducing them to the World Bank is endorsing it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to tell you that's going to happen. But I want to thank Lucy Lett, Mr. Speaker, for their, for their support in the Street Light Project. And I understand that Lucy Lett will also be ordering some lights for St. Lucia, LED lights. So, my colleagues will have an abundance of lights to shine. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, and I want to show you how this government operates. And he talked about consultancy fees. Part of this consultant fees, Mr. Speaker, is for the geothermal project in, 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 in Soufre. Part of it. So again, so you see, this is how we do it, Mr. Speaker. Blue bonds, blue economy, LED lights, environmental sustainability, sustainability to reduce our carbon footprint. That is how this government works, Mr. Speaker. Work with a plan. But you'll hear more of that in the in the policy debate, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I thought I was rather disturbed by the mannerisms and the things that the minister, the parliamentary representative, for the parliamentary representative, sorry, thank you, sorry, for, for Mikusov did, Mr. Speaker, and you know, I don't like to do that, but I must. I must, Mr. Speaker. I must do it. Because many people talk about traveling. And he came and he accused the minister for, for the minister for sports of traveling, Mr. Speaker. And I know I, I'm going to get blasted on their social media for that. They're going to say most things about me, more things about me now. Refund for accommodation. Talk about traveling. Traveling. July 19th, 2019. And that bill comes from a hotel called One Ham Yard. Remember for Viva Sub, you know that hotel? <laughs> One Ham Yard. <laughs> you know it. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, these things. Accommodation per night. 1,795 pounds sterling plus 359 pounds sterling. 2,154 £2, pounds per night. 2,154 £2, pounds per night. Six nights, what the government paid was, fought at three, the government paid for six nights, $48,981. $48,981. For six nights. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, I had to do it because too many lies and too much righteousness, too much perceived righteousness is being is being peddled in television. Mr. Speaker, and we have been challenged. Do this, do that, do this. Right now, Mr. Speaker, we'll take the challenges because there is a lot of information that we are going to disclose because they challenge us. Because, you know, Mr. Speaker, we won elections in July and we went around doing the business of the country. Doing the business of the country. We didn't interfere with anybody. We, Mr. Speaker, this is the first government that has kept top civil servants when they change like that. We kept all the permanent secretaries except one. We kept the commissioner of police. We kept the head of fire. We kept the head of the of the. We kept we kept the CMO. We kept all. But the accused of victimization. The accused of it, Mr. Speaker. We kept all these people. We worked with them. The arrogance, Mr. Speaker, of government ministers never rose his head with with, with my ministers. <coughs> and I speak to them all the time. I tell them, don't interfere in the civil service. Let the civil service do what they have to do. Sometimes they, they're very annoyed with me for that, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, he, these guys, but they just come and they talk and talk and attack us, attack us, attack us, Mr. Speaker. And right now, the attacks have got personal and way below the belt. So we, I put you on notice, Mr. Speaker, that there are going to be, there's going to be a many revelations made in this honorable house in, a, a, in, in short order. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, you will hear the whole story about the vaccines. <coughs> you will hear the whole story about the land at Pleasant, at, at Mount Pleasant, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> you will hear the whole story about the, the John Compton Dam de Silton. Yeah. You will hear the whole story about the Super SSDF, Mr. Speaker. You had a whole story about the road, Mr. Speaker. Because, Mr. Speaker, we have been challenged. We've been attacked. We've been accused, Mr. Speaker. But I'll, I'm, I'm going to put on notice, Mr. Speaker, that these attacks are going to be more vicious because they, the stories will come out, Mr. Speaker. So, six nights of a hotel. You pay forty-eight thousand nine hundred eighty-one dollars ninety-six cents. Six nights of a hotel. Six nights. That means, Mr. Speaker, for one night, for one night, Mr. Speaker, the hotel was six divided by forty-eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand dollars a night for one night in a hotel. You think that any of us, when a member of Viewfort South, could ever do that? We would. He would write the church. You take it from our side, won't you? <laughs> yeah, I know that. I'm Mr. Speaker, and I'm in the same. Yeah, and I'm sure neither member of Viewfort North, and surely not for me. And these men and women know they can't do that. You think any cabinet minister can tell me to go on a trip and the hotel is $8,000 a night? <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, so when, so the, 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 the rebuttal, Mr. Speaker, is going to be attack on my daughter. That's the rebuttal. I'm waiting for it. Mr. Speaker, you know, I have been the, you see, Mr. Speaker, I have been the, recently, Mr. Speaker, Philip Jepier has become the, the flavor of the month. So my daughter got attacked, Mr. Speaker. I just want to make a, point, a little point, Mr. Speaker, about this attack, this personal attack, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when somebody attacks you personally, and you know there is truth, then you know that there, there is truth in some of the attacks. Then you 
you feel very down, you feel consoled, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, what I'm concerned about is what that causes other people who want to get into politics. The impression it makes on young people who want to make a contribution to the country, Mr. Speaker. That's what concerns me, Mr. Speaker. That's what concerns me. Because when people just say things about you that have absolutely no truth, and they cannot in any way prove it, and they never, and the member mem from Miku saw, Mr. Speaker, that is why we do not accept the so called apology that he made in his honorable house. Collectively and individually, we do not accept it. Because we know it's not sincere. Because that's the same member in the last election, they have a thing on me, they say I have a speech impediment. That's what they say about me. I have a speech impediment, I-M-P-E-D-I-M-E-N-T. -E -E I want to ask one person, if when I speak to them, they never understand what I say. <laughs> huh? One person. I want to ask one person in the whole world, if when I speak, they can't understand what I say. But they say, <laughs> yeah. but they say, <laughs> They say I have a speech impediment. So when they ask, when they ask, when they ask the member for Miku South, when he was prime minister, somebody put press him in, and when when he had the leader of the opposition, where there is money for also, what did he say? You, you, you know what he did? That's what he did. That's what he did, Mr. Speaker. That's what he did. But everybody has, has forgotten that. But Mr. Speaker, I will never get personal with any politician during my career. Never. <coughs> All of them that believe they don't have sardine and corned beef, let them go ahead. All of them that believe that they don't have sardine and corned beef tin, let them go ahead. But I will never get personal. Never. Never. My integrity doesn't allow me to get personal, Mr. Speaker. And my, my parents will turn in the grave if they ever heard me go and earn man's children and his wife and his girlfriend in politics. They say, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I will never do it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and the public of St. Lucia is, is listening, you know. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. Uh, let me read for you, Mr. Speaker, something that was sent to me by somebody who was concerned. And that person is not a, a politician. <clears throat> that person is not a politician. I have never experienced this level of nastiness, the dirtiness, the lies, the acrimony, the racism, the institutionalized corruption as we have today. And this has started with the advent of a certain set of people in politics. It is scary and sad because I strongly believe that this lawlessness has pervaded every aspect of our society. And that is the opinion of someone about solution politics. Where is, where is the Mr. Speaker? And you never heard, Mr. Speaker. I can bring it up, Mr. Speaker, because it was said in the summer, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Apart from the fact they say I have a speech impediment, <coughs> they have made said other things which, Mr. Speaker, I come to this honorable house and I say to people, my father was a policeman. I, sh I, I should not say that. I come and I say to the young people of this country, that you have to aspire to get the degree the best you can and to aspire to be Prime Minister of St. Lucia, no matter who you are and no matter where you come from. That's what I preach. But no, but inside here, come and talk about somebody as a non-entity. Who knows them? And that's the difference, Mr. Speaker. I preach that we must aim at the highest heights 
for anybody regardless of where you come from. Where you come from the George Charles Boulevard, where you come from the Mang, where you come from Bruceville, where you come from Fuller Show, where you come from Bellevue, where you come from Odlum City, you must strive to be the best you can. This is my philosophy, Mr. Speaker. Ordain your revere. This is my philosophy. But they attack me for it. I, I say to people of St. Lucia that <clears throat> never judge a man because of where he came from or where he was. Judge him for what he is now and as he has, how he has aspired to greatness. <clears throat> I tell members of the police force to not get involved in sexual harassment and treat women with dignity and respect. And I say that the, your name or your, or your complexion should not be anything that you determine the job or how you aspire in this society. That's what I say. These are the values that I preach. These are the values, Mr. Speaker. And all my life, you can see these values coming true. So that is why, that is why, they figure they can attack me on personal things, Mr. Speaker. Every one of the attacks is a lie. Exactly, but attack me on the management of the economy. Every word is a lie, Mr. Speaker. Every word. House at Capital State, not true. BMW given by me, not true. Daughter, not true. Godson, worse. <laughs> Godson, worse, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Then, to make it worse, I went. And you see, you see, the scorn and the contempt and the disregard that is about for people. I went to view for Mr. Speaker. Remember, if you were served, you were there, but I didn't say I was going. <laughs> I went to I went to view what's up, Mr. Speaker, and I went. You know, Mr. Speaker, you can ask my colleagues. Everybody knows that I like this conkles nonsense. I like that. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows it. So, Mr. Speaker, I went to a rest uh, a shop in Viewfort, in Bruceville. The, the fellas there were very happy. Because, Mr. Speaker, what they don't understand about me is. And that is why they underestimated me. My roots in the politics is very deep. I went, I lined with the minimum of Viewfort South in Viewfort. In fact, my father is from Viewfort North. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. They, they, they don't know that. Deep roots. Deep roots, deeply rooted, Mr. Speaker. So I went to view, I went into Viewfort South. I went to, it was Bruceville you went to? So I went there, and a guy took me in the shop, and he said to me, he said, boss, come and see a shop that, he said, Kenny, help me to build. Ma. In the ma, right, ma. ma. That, Kenny, help me to build. So I went in there, and I said to the guy, give me a, a thing of chips there. You understand? So, you see, Mr. Speaker, what they don't understand, they don't understand that I have that connection with people that they don't have. I had just come. So I... I had, I took the chips and the guy, the guy said, boss man, hold that. So I sat on the thing and I opened the chips and I eaten it. So they decide that I look like a chimpanzee. You understand? Now you know why they said so? Because they had put a call out in Unipac try to see what we can do to counteract the Prime Minister's visit to Viva South. They put a call out. United, a, call was, a call went out. So when he comes and he plays innocent, and he doesn't know, he's a contributor to United Park. <coughs> you understand? When they play, don't know. They, a call went out, Mr. Speaker. Try to see, re make recommendations. <coughs> make recommendations. That investigation is coming too. We're going to, yes, there are people who have drawn government salary for years. That's going to come too. That's coming too, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, and I tell my colleagues to brace themselves. Brace. <coughs> because the attacks from them are going to be worse and more vicious. So, what happened is that? So, we went. So, United Prime, Park. Prime Minister, you have 10 minutes left. Huh? United Park, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm finishing. United Park put out a go get him. 
and this guy came out with the chimpanzee connotation. Mr. Zika, but I know everybody knows I don't like a chimpanzee. A good-looking fellow like me. <laughs> I mean, so if I read about it, I can read about it. So these things are petty things, nasty, child. <laughs> you right. They used to attack me for wearing sunglasses. Red child. One day I go and I see all the other sunglasses. I see what I'm doing. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, that's a, that's a, 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 a lighter note, Mr. Speaker. No, Mr. Speaker, seriously, um, we really need to change that culture in Tanusha. Sure. That's way into it. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank members for the con members for the contribution to this to this these estimates. The policy statement is in the last Tuesday in April, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what the these statements sought to do, they sought to consolidate St. Lucia, but not allowing it to stagnate. And it's a difficult, difficult task. Consolidation without stagnation in an environment that is very, 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 very difficult, Mr. Speaker. After COVID came the Ukraine, the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war caused serious disruptions. The difference between COVID and the Ukraine war is that during COVID, the whole country stopped. During the Ukraine war, the whole country began to move, but the, the, the levers of movement were not oiled enough. So you find shipping was, was a problem, supply chain issues up to now, absence of pilots, absence of airlift, etc., Mr. Speaker. So that is a double whammy. But I must say, the country is working together. I want to thank my colleagues. <coughs> my colleagues, sometimes we have to, we have some discussions on, on issues. Sometimes opinions vary. But I must say, I have the fullest cooperation from the cabinet of the government of St. Lucia. I want to thank them, and I really want to thank them for that, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the, the, the civil service, the Mem Minister, Minister of Finance, in, in understanding that we treat them as professionals, and their job is to give us the best professional advice and to understand we will take the decisions based on the professional advice that they give us. But the decision, the decision making is ours. I want to thank special Mr. Speaker, the members of the Solution Police Force. Mr. Speaker, 99.9% of members of the police force are hardworking, good policemen, sincere, but there are 0.5% that needs to change. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank them. The pressure has been on them recently, Mr. Speaker, but they, they are producing. In the policy statement, I will tell you some of the, the initiatives that we go there. And I want to thank the member for Shozel. He offered to assist as far as that's concerned, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member Shozel is, is basically a good guy, you know, in bad company. <laughs> and I've said to him that there is nothing wrong in changing your mind. <laughs> Footballers pay for Manchester United and they go to Liverpool. They still play football. Yes, they were in Chelsea and they go to Arsenal. Arsenal. They still play football. They even live. They even live. They even live serious, serious teams. And go to places. Much as if your team is bad. So, Mrs. Mrs. Speaker. Thank you very much. The policy statement is coming, and I think we'll be on the right track. And together, Senusha will make Senusha progress. Thank you very much.